Good morning. Um, I'm going to just start the introduction to the session a little bit early because it's, um, it's a slightly different format and I want to make sure that everybody is familiar and prepared. Um, my name is Kimberly Hill. I'm a faculty member at the University of Minnesota and I'm um, joined here by my co-conveners Enrico Viparelli and Philippe Frey. Um, and we are very excited about granular physics and its applications to geomorphology. Um, and we're, we're so excited that we decided to try out the, uh, some of AGU's new formats. Um, so I want to say first to, um, especially for all the speakers, to um, remind you that there's going to be a discussion at the end, which is, means that we would like to invite you all to come to the front at the end of the talk period, which is a, just a little bit after 12. Uh, so the, the session will start with our two invited talks, um, and then uh, and those are of normal length. And then we have uh, uh, six contributed talks, which are slightly shorter, 10 minutes in length. Um, and so we'll have the light shortened up accordingly, probably just a time for a little bit of questions after those talks. And then we wanted our poster presenters to get into the fray as well. So there's going to be f uh, four short pop-ups at the end of the session of just a minute each. So really, uh, you know, unfortunately, no time for the questioning for that. But if there's just four minutes, um, there'll be plenty of memory, hopefully, for you to ask some questions during the, during the panel session at the end. Uh, so we'll gather everybody, we, we just hope that all the presenters can stay until the end or, uh, and, and then um, come up to the front and we'll turn uh, the front row of chairs around facing the audience. And, and um, we all want you to feel free to ask questions both about their specific talks or maybe some general questions about the application of particle scale dynamics to system scale processes um, or anything else that might occur to you of interest for granular physics. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to in, in, uh, introduce our first invited speaker, Anthony Thornton from University of Twente. Um, and he'll be talking about a segregation mobility feedback that, that he and his group are working on. Right, well, th firstly, thank you very much for the invite. And secondly, I'm gonna apologize because I won't actually get to talk about the feedback as such. I'll just talk about the segregation bit. However, if you're interested in the feedback, Ivana has a poster discussing exactly the feedback bit. But I am just gonna talk about the segregation itself and briefly mention the feedback. And what I'm gonna work up to do is this experiment here, which will be the thing I am working up towards. Okay, ah, wrong button, too many buttons. Okay, so first of all, I want to justify why we're interested in this by some things I've been involved with. So what we're interested in looking at is developing a model of segregation and then developing feedback between the segregation. So the segregation actually feeds back on the bulk dynamics so we can predict structures like this. This is the uh, pyrocratic flow from Mount St. Helens. But here's some things uh, which I want to justify this. Uh, be warned, this video is from England, and England's a bit of a strange place, so gravity goes this way. But this is the sort of systems we're interested in. So here we've got two different mixtures of grains, and as the system flows, the segregation leads to the... Uh, as the system flows, the segregation drives the large material at the front, which in this case is carboemdum, so it's rougher, and this rough front, this slow rough material causes it to break up into a sequence of fingers. And this is the kind of stuff we want to predict, and the kind of stuff we're working at. This is a very old video from Jim Valance of uh, USGS, which is a very old video he did looking at this. So you can't see very well, but at the front here you've got large particles and you've got this big thick head because of the segregation. So what you've got again is you've got segregation driving the large material to the front, and because the large material is at the front, you get a much thicker bulbous head flow at the back, and then you get the sorted material which is uh, thinner at the front. Now, Arana will explicitly be talking about, her poster is explicitly about this topic. She will show how you can use the models I'll describe to predict such structures. Uh, this I always show, this is actually the largest experiments I ever did in my life as a postdoc. So this here is the USGS flume. And uh, for those who are not familiar with it, this flume is 82.5 meters long and two meters wide. These are roughly one meter grid scales. I can say it's roughly one meter grid because for this particular experiment, I had the job of painting the grid lines. Um, so what you've got here <laughs> is two different materials flowing down water saturated and flowing to the bottom. Now, when this gets to the bottom, what do we expect to happen? So, anybody? This talk's interactive. So, as the flow gets to the bottom, what do you expect to happen? Do you expect it to spread out? Who expects it to spread out? Okay, who expects it to do something different than spreading out? Who, hasn't, who doesn't work for me? 
Uh, okay. Okay, so what you see here, as it flows to the bottom, as you can see, clearly see, it spreads out. Oh, no, sorry, it didn't. Okay, so the reason this does not spread out is because of the segregation. And what's happened is the large material has been transported to the front, and then the, as the large material gets transported to the front, it gets pushed to the side, building its own walls. So what you can see here is a self-channelizing flow. The large material is being pushed to the front and building walls. And this flow is water-saturated, and just watch how long it takes the water to come out. So this process really is driven by the segregation, not by the water. So uh, the segregation drives the large material to the front, which builds these channels and completely changes the flow. Okay, so the, the system I'm going to discuss is a slightly simpler system. For now, I am just going to consider in this talk an avalanche going down the hill. And, I, I am going to, and of course, as I said, you've got segregation going on, which drives the large material to the top. And because the flow is faster at the top, it then drives the large material to the front, and the small material gets drives to the back. So I'm thinking of a finite mass avalanche flowing down the hill. And in this talk, I am not going to talk explicitly about the feedback, even though the speaker two after me will definitely talk about the feedback with friction, and Arana has a poster talking about the feedback, because as this segregates, it definitely feeds back and changes the friction, which changes the flow. But here, I'm just going to talk about can we predict the structure inside? Can we actually predict what the segregation structure is here? Okay, so this is my only slide with maths, I promise. Um, this is my only slide with maths. So to predict the segregation, everybody uses, well, not everybody uses, a lot of people uses models of this style. Where is the screen? Models of this style here. Okay, so this was the original model proposed in 2005, which had a very simple flux here, which is this phi minus phi uh, rho g. Uh, then the models were evolved a bit. In 2006, there was a diffusion term added here, which I will actually not discuss. Uh, in 2011, there was a suggestion what rather than being driven by the contact stress, the rho g, it was driven by the kinetic stress, um, but still kept the phi 1 minus phi structure. In 2016, um, oh, I jumped two. Uh, in 2014, this more complicated cubic flux was discerned. So rather than going for this quadratic style flux, this cubic flux was taken. And in 2016, we decided what the actual correct combination is this cubic flux with the uh, idea what it drives with the kinetic stress. So that is the form we now prepare, prefer, and this constant k here, this value k, actually is a function of the size ratio. So all the physics about the size of the material seems to go into this constant k. So that is the model we currently like. However, for this talk, I'll make two points out. What for these uh, flows we are considering here, the diffusion is very small. So I'm going to neglect this diffusion term here. And in the majority of a shoot flow, it's not true near the surface or near the base, the kinetic stress does seem to go right the contact stress. So using this form or this form gives, rough, gives pretty much the same answer. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to look at using these two different fluxes and see what happens. Okay, so just to give you an idea, if you take these models, if you take these models, and this is the idea here, this, this probably won't work with this bigger audience, but if you want to see this again, Orana will demonstrate it. So what we've got here is two different sized materials, and if I let it go, you should hopefully see, is the light good enough? You should see the green stuff has gone to the top and towards the bottom, and the stuff is segregated. Okay, now if we take these models, uh, again, if you want to see this, you can play with Orana. If we take these models, you can see what the solving these models mathematically, they lead to this forward segregation. They lead to the, uh, here you've got the mixed material, phi here is the mixed material. And what these models predict is the large material goes up and to there and the small materials go down. So these models do lead to segregation, which looks something like the experiments. You can do experiments and you see simple segregation here. But what we're interested in this case is not these long shoots. We're actually interested in a finite mass avalanche. Now, in 2005, we saw, if we did some numerics, I'll just jump in so it's the second one, where we changed the inflow conditions. We saw what, if we changed the inflow conditions, you could get this complicated structure at the front. So this is like a propagating finite mass avalanche. And what you see here is you get this complicated segregation profile here. So it's not a simple large on top of small. At the, in the middle of the avalanche, in a propagating avalanche, there's this complicated structure. So in 2006, we actually studied this further, and this is now a moving frame. So this is following this complicated structure. So this is tracking the pro segregation profile you ex expect in the middle of an avalanche, and you can see you get this complicated lens structure. Now, 
The colour is representative of the concentration. The, of the sorry, particles. I should have said that. The colour is representative of the concentration. So here the blue is the large particles, the red is the small, and the different colours are the different concentrations. So what you've got is in the middle of a finite out propagating avalanche, these theories predict you should have this complicated structure. So you don't have a sharp interface, but you have this complicated structure. So the question becomes, can you see this structure? And this is going to be the theme of my talk, is looking at can we actually experimentally see this structure? And are these models capable of predicting this complicated stuff in the middle of a finite length avalanche? So that was done in 2008, but as I said, since 2008, the, 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 the theories have evolved a long way. So in 2016, we re-derived these structure using the more modern foxes. And what you get here is, is three things. You get the large material gets segregated to the front, the small material to the back. You've got this the strange structure we had before, but now you've got this tail. And this tail represents a tiny, tiny amount of large particles which go round and recirculate. So you get this tiny, large recirculation. So most of the complicated structure is here, but you've got this tiny concentration which is just off being 100% poor, pure. So we call this the lens and the tail. And this is what this uh, predicts. The question is, can we see this? So what we did is we built ourselves an infinite length avalanche. So we built a uh, moving bed channel. So we built ourselves a moving bed channel with two different sized particles on it. And we run the moving bed so we can track the, you know, in essence, we're following an uh, infinite avalanche. The way this is visualized is RIMS, which is reflective index match microscopy. So we add a fluid to it. We shine a laser light through it. The fluid glows, the particles do not glow, so we can actually take data from the middle of the chute. So it's a wide chute, but we're only taking data from the center line by using this trick with the laser. And what we get, if we show the video, is this is the segregation on the center line. So as you can see, the large particles get transported to the front in this moving belt, the small particles get transported to the back, and we see this line here. And you know, it vaguely looks like it. I won't explain how, but we have a very advanced technique of extracting what this looks like. This is the actual density profile. So you can see, you can see the, the large stuff goes to the front, the small stuff goes to the back, and there's this stripe of large stuff, a small amount of large stuff that you can see here, it gets traveled back. You can think of this as a time-exposed photograph. It's almost the same. So to compare that with the actual analytical solution, there is definitely some agreement here, and this cubic fox you know, does predict this tail region, which we do seem to see, so it does seem to reinforce what these models are at least capturing the reading order behavior. So we did that with a simulation. The question is, can we also do it with a simulation? Uh, sorry, that was an experiment. We also did it with a simulation. So here we got a simulation where we got, a, again, the moving bed. And you can see the large particles transported to the front and the small particles transported to the back. And yeah, perfect. And again, we can do the same technique, and you get a structure very similar with the large at the front, the small at the back, and a complicated, this is, we hope, the lens structure and the tail structure. And comparing against that, it looks somewhat similar to it. So to bring myself, myself to a, a, a rough conclusion, um, I've introduced a segregation model, a sequence of segregation models and different fluxes. I've explained we now like this cubic flux, which predicts what in a finite length avalanche, you should get this very complicated structure within the middle of the avalanche. And we have done both experiments and simulations to look at this structure and see if we can compare it. And we can see there's definitely comparison. Now the next step, which Arana will deal with in a poster, is how you go from knowing this segregation structure to coupling it through the friction to show feedback to which will predict the actual evolution and channelization effect. But that I'll leave to Arana, and I believe that is where I conclude. So I'd just like to say I have presented this model and showed what it can predict these complicated structures in which you can, we can see in both experiments and simulations. Okay, thank you. 52 seconds. Questions? Uh, maybe uh, I can ask one having to do with the um, sort of the very low concentrations. I might be like concerned as a geomorphologist how important that is, and I think that that might get to what you said Irana is going to talk about, but how important is that for the overall flow behavior, for yeah. example, when you have such low concentrations? You're completely right. If you read the paper and look at it, uh, this region here, where the lens region, it has a strong feedback. This tail here is... So here, where you've got a concentration which is changing, you get strong feedback. It affects the friction uh -huh. in this area. Whereas this tail region, it's not that important. Uh -huh. it, it's only important from the po point you do get these particles being trussed back. But the feedback due to the tail is minor. Yeah. Okay. Then I had another question about what you said at the beginning as far as the, the self-forming levees yep. um, being 
only due to the segregation. And I feel like I, it's been seen without segregation. Yeah, it's true. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Can you qualify that then? <laughs> uh, yes, there are several proposed mechanisms for this. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, you can definitely produce this with the segregation. Ivana will show how this works. You can produce with the segregation models, but there is other ways to produce this. Uh, and yeah, it's an open question, which is why you need to do work of this, of which actual mechanism is driving this. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, well, we'll have more time to ask Anthony questions and interrogate him about the application to geomorphology during the panel session. So let's just thank him again. And the next um, speaker is our second invited, invited speaker, Margan Husses, um, and she'll be talking about slow sedimentary processes on a chip experiments. Is it on a Mac? Because that says that says Mac dot text. Okay, so I'm guessing Mac. How do I? So where's the? Do you, do you, are you a Mac person? Yeah, I don't okay. know. It's okay, I can. Oh, yeah, here. Here. It's supposed to be a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it can uh, still be a. Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so can you run it? About it? So this is this is this. You know, you know, this? this is the this is what the the mouse that you can use. Oh, okay. If you want to, and here's the this, and you can cool. do that, all right? And then um, we have a pointer. So if I like, can play mu movies and things. You can, yeah. You can play movies with the uh, mouse. So right oh, now it's, it's loading. Opening. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a bit heavy because there's the movies, but okay. Well, hi everybody. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> uh, st still loading. Uh, well, I have the first slide, so I'll, all right, for those who didn't hear, hear it. Uh, so my name is Morgan Nousse. I'm a research associate now at the Levitch Institute, and I collaborate with those gentlemen. We should not be typed that small. Uh, <laughs> that's a <laughs> keynote PowerPoint uh, translation, but uh, I like them. <laughs> They're from the uh, professor from the chemical engineering and physics department. And uh, what I'm going to show here, uh, first I have to apologize, there will be zero segregation in this talk, so this is a bit of a scam. But um, people who know me a bit know that I tend to put two particles in, in, in experiment at a point, and this is a brand new experiment, so there's probably a point where I'll put two particle, uh, two particle size in it. And the second reason why I'm happy to be here is I think uh, probably in this room, there's people who might enjoy the most uh, the, the movies I'm going to show. All right, this works. So, how do I, how do I pass the... Here's the, here's the... Ah, here I don't okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, and this experiment is about uh, creep, and creep more like in soil situation. There's no flow, downward flow to the surface. It's not a river. This is just a pile of, of sand tilted, and oh, my question here is how a porous flow through it might affect at which uh, speed the creep happens. So how does this all creep? Okay, we see it everywhere, but actually um, it's, it's the mechanic of it is, is pretty tricky and, and complicated. So um, I think we, there's still a lot of work to do on it. Uh, also, we know a lot of things about it, and, and here is my favorite data set about that. Uh, so from uh, Rory et al. and Dietrich et al. in the year 2000, uh, we know well from <coughs> For me, field data are most than, than experimental data, but uh, the, the field data are, are really great to show this dependence of the sediment flux of, of, of ill slope with the topographic gradient. That's pretty clear. But, of course, there is this problem that it does scatter a lot, and this is uh, indirect measurement from uh, uh, cosmogenic radionically dated. So, um, you can wonder, and actually I'm pretty sure that there's actually other stuff going on that just the topographic gradient in this, in this trend. And that's a picture where you can actually guess that a, a bit. That's, uh, that's a typical it's slope when, all right, you can compute the slope everywhere. It's nice and smooth, and it seems the vegetation is everywhere the same, but clearly here it moves faster than here, right? So for the same slope, you have a much faster uh, dynamic in there, so you, you, you can see how uh, if you sample this area, you're going to get this, this range uh, going on. 
So very quickly, <clears throat> my point here, my interest is to know if uh, what the porous flow could itself do. There's many other things we can do, things, vegetation, the, the, the earthquakes, etc. Here I'm just going to talk about if it rains on it and there is a porous flow for it, what is the effect of the, of the, on the particle? And there's some uh, previous work on this. There is uh, a certain experiment to show that if you rain and you saturate a soil, depending on how loose or dense it is, uh, there is an important feedback between the pore pressure and the speed of, of avalanching. Uh, interestingly, there's a, more recently, you at all in 2014, who have observed um, similar, similar behavior for, for uh, underwater and the sea um, deposits who are more or less dense will, will dep depending on that, do more bridging or, or, or sliding. And so they think, and I agree with them, that this is more or less about the same thing, and there's a lot to uh, think commonly on this. But oh yeah, if, I, if I synthesize in my view what's going on, all right, here's a little square of soil tilted on a given slope, and when it rains on it, you saturate it, a uh, certain part of it. This is simplified, but that's, that's how I think about it. And so now you are at a given, it, it's stable, which means that you are at a given slope where you're under the critical slope where locally the stress supply versus the, the effective pressure uh, is under the critical one, which is the, the effective the static friction in the system, all right? No, for a given reason, which is not necessarily clear, imagine there is some bed compaction, maybe because it was loose and it got a bit chicken or I don't know, and uh, there is some bed compaction, so that produced that you have this sponge which is no press and the flow goes up. And if you have a flow goes in, going up here, the effective pressure in your little, in your little parcel is reduced. So now you're in this situation that uh, given that the pressure is reduced locally, you might have the stress being above uh, the mu s equal p. And that's the, the, the granular rheology tell you that in that case, you can avalanche it, all right? For now, we were, that's, that's Everson's story, more or less. Um, but now what I'm thinking is, what if, fun, what is, you have a bit of that, which is porous floor, not that big, and, 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 uh, and you're still under this, or you're close to it, but still under this. You, don't, you cannot just like flush it up. And, that's, and this part is where actually the granular creep can happen. So does that, make, does that do anything on a granular creep or, or, or not? So this is where I, I bring my, my little experiment. Uh, so this is a microfluidic ouch. So I, I brought it here, I forgot it, of course, it's there. It's a little piece of... I brought it from New York. <laughs> it's uh, so it's a little bit of, of plastic, PDMS, it's a bit uh, flexible. If you want to see it later, please, please come. Um, so, so, so I fixed this piece on, is this working? Do you see? Ah, it's very weak. Okay. Uh, so I fixed it on this, this rigid frame, frame which is attached to a rotating uh, angle, so I can, at a given time, Fix the fix the slope at, at the beginning of my experiment. I fix the slope and I fix uh, a given discharge through the system, which with the little syringe that you can see back there. And so this is like around two centimeter in the depth. Uh, it's a 2D cell and it's a depth of around 500 micron. And in here I put 300 micron plastic spherical particle and and water. So here what it looks like. Uh, so see from a from the front, so it's, it's all vertical. And um, uh, yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, so this, this is a movie with uh, actually zero slope. And, <clears throat> great, thank you so much. Uh, so I fixed the slope at zero here, it's just to show you that this is a specific experiment where I increase the flux, oops, from uh, zero to a critical, uh, it's written here down, that move a little bit from zero to a QFC, which is the critical uh, slope at which it's, um, uh, it, will, it will start to erode itself. So for a long time, nothing happened because you're under this, this critical flux and around here, is it two, two point nine? around here, the, f the flow will become strong enough. So it's homogeneous because it's a 2D cell and flow then is strong enough that will start to 
be able to, to erode locally the system, and you can see you start to channelize, uh, channelize it. And I keep increasing, so it's, it's, it keeps, it keeps uh, eroding through it. Right. So I'd like to show you the mo this movie just to fill, because then it's going to be very small displacement, but here you can see that you know, we, can, we, can, we can fully mobilize all the particle in the system. I'm going to stop it here because it's a bit long. But me, the part I'm interested in is actually what happened before, where you can see that a little bit of rearrangement happened under this critical flux, and that's what I'm interested in, where the, the creep regime can, can occur. So this is the experiment I, I want to show you now. Uh, so now there is a fix. Um, I fix my, my slope at the, at the beginning, and for now I impose zero flow, just to show you that that's the, there's a movie, this is a 25 minute experiment, accelerated, that mostly nothing happened. At least for this time window, I cannot, I cannot see any uh, displacement, or not, not a lot. There was a tiny bit at the, at the beginning, but mostly nothing. And now I flew through it. And I flow for it at this, at this rate, which is well under the critical uh, for, for it. And so you can see now that uh, stuff happened at the surface, slowly. And I think uh, that it's, it, it is in the creep, creep regime. If I play it faster, so again, this is 25 minutes. You can see that the whole surface is rearranging for time. So no, same experiment, uh, same slope, but a bit higher, higher uh, discharge, and you can see that it's also moving and more. Hmm. You can say faster when you can see the, the amplitude of the depth at which the rearrangement occur. So then I do the hard work, I track everything with uh, those nice free software Python module here, I get the track, and in a given uh, area which is not too close from the side, of course, because uh, they weird, I can compute uh, the, the particle velocity, this is the blue point, and I compute an average for this, how to do that in this, this paper, and this is for the 20, 20 milliliter per minute experiment, this is, this is for the 80. And that's what it looks like a bit bigger. I know here I, I give you the, the amplitude of that if I extrapolate to like oh, it is in meter, meter per day. So that is going to give you like at the very surface few meter, one to few meter per year, all right? So slow, but not that slow. <laughs> we can talk about that. Um, so now that I have the velocity profile, I can, uh, to talk about total flux, I can just integrate the velocity profile and know Instead of having just versus slope, I have versus the upward water flux, and for one given slope, I don't know if you can see a green area like this. Yeah, so this is the free experiment I have. So one given slope, I can increase the sediment flux with the upward water flux. I can repeat this experiment at a higher slope and see that yes, there is still a slope effect, of course. And uh, fi the final things I want to, to point out is that uh, uh, an important part of the, this, this problem is if, what about if the flow is not fixed but, OC, but fluctuating, that it's rains, don't rain anymore, blah, blah, blah. And so I make the same experiment with an oscillatory condition with the, the same range. Hmm. And this is, so in short, it's moving more. Um, yeah. And, and here is the, is the, um, here is uh, the, this effect of oscillation. So in average, I'm here, and the, through this oscillation, I'm up there, and this is some conclusion. I'm really happy, excited this experiment work. Uh, this is what more or less I just said. Uh, there's many things more to say, but I don't have time that we can discuss more as soon as we want. And just a few things that I want to do now is measure concentration and the effective pressure. Uh, that I can do in the next month, so I'm excited about that, because we can look really at the rheology detail. And uh, then there's a, like, we can do the flow from the top to bottom. That can be interesting to understand what's, like, when the rain flow, what's, does that perturb the system? And uh, what if the, the downward stream, what if we had the downstream um, flow condition? And that's something I'm, I'm, I'm looking for people in Massachusetts to eventually think with me next year. Uh, 
because I'm moving there. Thank you. Thanks. So maybe while Rally is coming up, we have time for one very, very short question. Okay. Um, so there's always more time during the panel at the end. Yeah. Discussion yeah. at the end. Yeah. Panel discussion. Um, so the, the, re the next set of talks will be the 10 minute talks and so the yellow light will come on at eight minutes and then the red at nine. Okay. Thanks, Martin. Okay, so it's my uh, pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Valé Martin. Uh, we're going to go lighter because uh, he will talk, be talking about uh, something about uh, Aeolian saltation. Yeah, and then we got a working uh, okay. thing here. Okay. I don't need that. <laughs> uh, so I apologize, I don't have any props um, with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk today about wind driven or Aeolian sediment transport and look at the um, size selective transport processes in these environments. And this is work that I've done um, in my postdoc with Jasper Koch at UCLA. Um, so a brief introduction, saltation refers to the ballistic hopping motion of sand grains as illustrated in this image from wind tunnel experiments by Bagnold. Um, and I just wanted to define a couple of terms here. Q is the saltation flux, the mass flux of saltating particles. Tau is the shear stress, which describes the strength of the wind. We're going to look at two particular parameters here, the mobility, uh, which is basically the slope of the relationship between the flux and the shear stress, C, uh, and then what I'm going to call the susceptibility, basically the threshold stress for initiating transport. Um, so now thinking in particular about a sediment bed containing multiple sizes, indicated by subscripts I, uh, we can define a size selective transport equation. Um, and for uh, comparison purposes, I'm going to normalize the size selective flux and shear stress um, by the fraction of those uh, different particle size classes in a sedimentary bed as illustrated here. Um, so now, um, based on this conceptual framework, we can think of a few different possible ways in which we would have size selective transport. This one end member case here, we have selective mobility, different um, slopes of this relationship for different particle size classes and different thresholds. The other end member possibility would be that we have equal mobility and equal susceptibility. Um, and then there are uh, cases in between selective mobility, equal susceptibility, uh, or equal mobility, uh, and selective susceptibility. Um, so to examine uh, these size selective processes, I'm going to look at some field observations collected at three field sites. Um, this is an illustration of our Oceano field site where we collected by far the most observations. And in fact, we kind of divided it into four um, virtual field sites due to the spatial separation of our instruments and the evolution of that bed surface through time. Um, to capture the shear stress, we used a sonic anemometer uh, and applied Reynolds stress method to that. Uh, that's shown in the middle of the image. Uh, for the um, saltation flux and the particle size distributions for the size selectivity, uh, we used BSNE uh, saltation traps mounted at heights ranging from 5 centimeters to 30 centimeters. And I just want to note that, uh, importantly, we're missing the lowermost part of that um, alien sediment transport process. Um, so the first thing I'm going to look at here are the size distributions of the, um, the uh, bed particle sizes, which are illustrated by the black curves, uh, and then the colored curves into indicate the particle size distributions of the airborne particles. And you can see a few things here. First of all, that there is a fining of the airborne saltators with respect to the bed. Uh, and this is probably in part due to the fact that we're not measuring the um, creep uh, and um, small scale motion of larger particle sizes. The second is that these airborne size distributions are pretty much insensitive to changes in the shear stress, which are illustrated by the different colors uh, in these diagrams except in the coarse tail of the distribution where there's actually a slight degree of fining that's occurring with increasing shear stress. Uh, and then the third thing is that we kind of generalize from this to uh, speculate that there is equal susceptibility, that is a common shear stress for the mobility of all particles that are um, of sizes that are less than uh, 1.5 times the median particle diameter of the sediment bed. So now looking at the mobility, the relative transport rates of these different particle size classes, um, we define two things here, the 
fi bed is the fraction of that size class in the bed, and fi air is the fraction of that size class in the saltation layer that we're measuring. Um, and so we have a diagram here, and in the diagram, uh, if this ratio is above one, that means that there's an enhanced mobility for that size class. Alternatively, if it's e about equal to one, we say that's equal mobility. And if the ratio is less than one, we say that's reduced mobility. So now we look at this, and we see that remarkably there's a similar um, trend of mobility by size class uh, at all of our field sites. And in particular, what we see is that in the fine range, there's possibly a slight or equal mobility case that's occurring. This is for particle sizes less than 0.4 times the median uh, bed particle size. In the medium range, there seems to be an enhanced mobility um, relative to what's in the bed. Uh, and then for particle sizes greater than 0.8 times the um, median bed particle diameter, there's a rapid reduction in the mobility with increasing particle size. Hmm. So now we look at um, some possible explanations for why there is this variation in particle mobility. Um, and in particular, we look at what we call a size selective saltation layer height. If we look at each size class, we, can, we notice that there's an exponential profile of saltation flux with height. We can look at the e-folding height of that profile, which you call z sub q, uh, with the i subscript for that particle size. What we expect is that um, because saltation is driven by impacts of particles with the surface and ejection uh, subsequently by the um, kinetic energy of those impacts, all uh, launched particles should be launched with roughly the same kinetic energy, and therefore the heights that they achieve should be in inversely proportional to their sizes. However, what we actually observe uh, is not really like that. Um, we see that, in fact, the smaller particles have um, lower saltation heights, and there's a maximum at the transition from medium to coarse particles. And so what we speculate, um, and there are multiple explanations for why this could be occurring, but what we think is that there is some kind of vertical drag that inhibits the finer and medium particles from achieving their full saltation heights. Um, and saltation height um, is somewhat reflective of the trajectory length that these particles follow when they are hopping in saltation. Uh, and so this could then affect the relative mobility of these different particle size classes. Um, there are other factors, um, uh, differential ejection rates of different particle size classes, and then another thing which I'm going to call saltator sustainability, that is once a particle is launched from the surface, it will um, engage in multiple hops, um, but different particle sizes might have a different number of hops after their initial ejection, and this could also affect the mobility. So putting these pieces together, this is our um, size selective mobility diagram that we've observed. Um, we speculate that in the fine range, um, there is a suppression of the particle trajectories that <coughs> slightly reduces their um, relative mobility. Um, but otherwise, these fine particles, they can sustain quite long trajectories because they're relatively lightweight. Um, in the medium range, the particles are kind of at the sweet spot. They have um, their full trajectory heights. There's not much vertical drag on them. But they're also small enough that they're able to continue in saltation for quite some time. Uh, and then finally, when we get into the coarse range of particles, these particles may be able to experience their full saltation hops. However, because they're heavy, they're, there's a very high probability they will be deposited and not continue in saltation after making one or two hops. Uh, so uh, just to conclude uh, what we've observed from these observations, uh, we uh, suspect that there's equal susceptibility, at least for particle sizes, less than about 1.5 times um, the surface uh, particle, median surface particle diameter. <laughs> However, there's a strong effect of size selective mobility, which we can divide into these three ranges of fine, medium, and coarse particles, uh, which we believe is related to the, um, the fullness of trajectories and the sustainability of these particle trajectories. Um, and I just want to point out that um, alien saltation differs in some fundamental ways from fluvial bed load transport in that um, the particles their motion is uh, really strongly driven by splash, the particles impacting with the bed and causing um, additional particles to be mobilized into saltation. So um, extending these uh, findings to a fluvial setting uh, may or may not be uh, very useful to do. And then finally, I just want to point out this limitation of our uh, study, which is that we only have observations uh, greater than five centimeters above the bed surface. So 
uh, we're missing a component that is related to the uh, creeping and reptation motion of particles closer to the bed. Um, and that is all, and I welcome questions if there's time. We have time for one or two questions. Uh, Gary? Uh, okay, I love saltpeter, saltpeter sustainability. Can you get known saltpeter resilience? <laughs> <laughs> So there are a few um, wind tunnel studies that have examined the relative ejection rates uh, and ejection velocities of different particle sizes for mixed bed. Uh, there are effects, but they seem to be very weak um, in terms of the differential uh, splash rates. Uh, but it hasn't been very heavily studied, so there could be more to do there. Okay, let's thank the speaker again and save your questions until the discussion. So next speaker is uh, Natalie Friend about mobile Markan Sandu. Mm -hmm. okay, <coughs> Hello, my name is Natalie Vriend and I'm going to talk today about the structure of uh, sandunes and its effect of uh, granulon particles. <laughs> Um, so, um, this is a collaboration together with Michel Luge and Anthony Hay, Hay from Cornell University and Alexander Valance from Rennes and, um, and Matthew Aaron, who's also in the uh, audience, who's my PhD student. So, um, desertification and dune migration are um, massive problems in some of the arid parts of our world. <laughs> I have an example here where we see a large Barken dune which is about half a kilometer across, and it's crossing across a, a road here, and basically blocking, and that road had to be closed. Um, and it threatens sediments and infrastructure downwind. So it's a major problem. And we want to understand dune migration and also the structure within, so that we can come up with measures to control or predict dune migration, and to perhaps find measures to limit it. And another application uh, is in the oil and gas industry, where dunes have transformed into sandstones and capture uh, oil uh, reserves. And uh, uh, we're interested in how to access those oil reserves. And for that, we need to understand the uh, fluid flow and the role of particles. So the central question today is, um, this is not right, is how do granular properties influ influence dune structure in nature? That's the amount of time before your question period. Okay. I don't think it started at 10. Um, it started at 9. Okay, cool. So Barken dunes are actually crescentic um, dunes, um, which are featured by low amount of available sand and an unidirectional wind regime. And the important thing is that they exist both in fluid and uh, air systems. And um, their propagation speed is um, f small dunes move faster than large dunes. And another component which Anthony already introduced earlier on is that whenever you have particles, you have also size segregation due to um, um, the fact that large particles rise and small particles fall. And this has a huge effect on uh, mobility of avalanches, for example. So that's kind of a, a quick introduction on two ingredients. So the field work that we conducted um, has occurred in Qatar on three different um, uh, periods uh, of a week each. We, um, uh, we were joined by a, a large collaborative group um, and the area is actually um, about an hour south of Doha. It's very flat and there is a scattering of uh, barken dunes of different sizes uh, in, this, in this area and a few camels. Uh, so this is uh, two, um, two examples of dunes that we are studying in this, uh, in this presentation. We have a small dune here at the top left which is only 5 meters high and moves at around 20 meters per year. And this large dune, um, it, the scale is, this is actually a car, to give you an idea. So it's half a <laughs> kilometer across. Um, it's very yeah. symmetrical. The wind is going from the bottom to the top. And it's about 30 meters high. And it moves at about three to four times slower than the small dune. Again, because small dunes move faster than large dunes. 
So in our campaign, we collected um, uh, data in, with a variety of um, uh, um, uh, methods. One was a Leica surveying for the topography of the dunes so that we can correct our profiles. We also dug sand pits um, in which we were both able to expose the layering, but also do targeted sand sampling and analysis. And also, very interesting, we did a ground penetrating radar. And people have used ground penetrating radar on dunes before, but they usually uh, use a frequency of about 100 or 200 hertz, a megahertz, to really kind of um, measure the entire structure up to the desert floor. We're, we chose a much higher frequency, 1200 megahertz. The drawback is that we're not able to penetrate that deep, only five meters. But the advantage is that we have very high range resolution of about three centimeters. And that gives us the ability to actually look at a much closer view at the internal layering. So what do we see when we dig a sand pit? We're taking the midline of this Barkan dune. So we're going straight across. This is the face um, that's pointing towards the wind. This is the slip face at the angle of repose. And if we take a, a pit here in the middle of the, 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 um, um, the dune, we see these layers appearing. And um, it's, it's accentuated by some coloring, that, which I'll explain in a moment. And open questions that we're interested in answering is, where is this layering coming from? What's the scaling? What kind of processes is it caused by? What are the physical features and also the geometry? So for example, what's the, what's the, the physics that sets the layer thickness or the length? So this is a kind of a zoom up. As I mentioned, we introduced um, some water to accentuate the layers. So we have some blue water that usually would penetrate down. But because of the layers, the, the water is actually transferring under an angle, which is the angle of repose where avalanches occurred before. And very interesting, the cross bedding is about two to three centimeters apart. And for the small dune, that's about one layer a day. So one, a critical person could say, well, that's perhaps uh, related to diurnal processes, day and night variation that creates this, this uh, variation in uh, permeability. Um, and the other thing to point out is that sometimes we have these irregular organic layers that are um, pointing out a few meters um, and, and very, they're very irregular. So we also did ground penetrating radar survey. This is across 50 meters and this is the raw profile where you see these organic layers popping through at um, irregular periods. We correlated the, um, these layers to meteorological events, which are basically rainfall events, which are very sparse in this arid environment. If we uh, apply automatic gain control and kind of bring up the layers very specifically, you can see the, 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 um, the layers at very uh, regular intervals at 30 degrees. We see the desert floor here. And we see also very interesting um, granular properties uh, coming up which is the shallowing near the base because of the avalanches that are shallowing out closer to the base. And we have um, local slip reversal here close to the, the crest of the dune where the wind was blowing from another direction um, for a, a small period. Um, so these cross beddings are actually uh, due to avalanches. So we actually looked at these layers specifically and did some particle measurements. And just to kind of remind you, we had the small and the big dune. They're moving at a different speed of about four times. And um, we find identical layer spacing between the two of them. So even though the layers appear in the small dune almost diurnal, they're really due to a mechanical process, the avalanche process. And why do these layers appear? We think it's because of size segregation in an avalanche. Particles rise up, uh, the large particles, the smaller particles roll down, you get uh, smaller particles in this permeability, uh, la permeable layer. Um, and we think it's due to um, clays. And we're actually right now conducting experiments in the lab under controlled conditions to get a good measure of the thickness of these avalanche deposits. Because it's avalanching on top of an erodible bed. So there's erosion and deposition during this mechanical process. We can also see um, if we take a more kind of a picture back and we take an average across the two dunes, the large and the small dune, we see that the average particle diameter is actually the same at the two dunes, but the particle distribution is much wider at the small dune, which gives to us uh, an indication that there is um, sorting if the slip phase is, is longer, 
for the large dune, we have a very fine particle distribution, so there was sorting, and the particle distribution has been narrowed. Um, and One that, more a few times. Thank you. That gives an, an indication that there's an initial um, difference in the distributions that are present in the two different sizes of dunes. And with that, I would like to conclude. Um, we looked at fascinating cross beddings in desert sand dunes. We exposed it with sand pits, but also imaged it continuously with ground penetrating radar. And the take home message is that there are permeable layers which are in the, the dune captured. And this is due to size segregation, and we find smaller particles in these permeable layers. We also find a difference between the uh, large and the small dune in particle distribution. And this has to do with some other segregation uh, mechanisms that are occurring on longer slopes. With that, mm -hmm. thank you. Presentation. One <laughs> second to go. One minute for questions. One minute. Yeah. Oh, good. So there's still time for one minute of questions, which is why it's nine minutes on the timer for good. anyone who's concerned that I'm cheating Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> Doug? Uh, Is that okay? Recirculation. Yeah, we actually have uh, quite finely spaced measurements uh, all across the uphill and the downhill side of the dune, and we're still analyzing them. So hopefully we'll have that, the data so, soon. Is there a question? Okay. Oh, question at the back. Yes. So we've done some filtering. We haven't done any uh, Kirchhoff migration. So we have made a correction for topography, but we haven't done a migration. Um, does that quickly answer your question? We can always follow up later. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we need to. Thanks. Can we thank our speaker? Right. Sorry. I don't know how to run that. <laughs> so. Uh, next speaker will be Lu Jing from uh, University of Hong Kong. Oh, oh. Uh, and we'll be talking about uh, effect base roughness on particle size segregation in granular avalanches. Are you Mac or PC? PC. Yeah, there is a question <laughs> PC or Mac. <laughs> All set. Good morning, everyone. My name is Louis Ding from the University of Hong Kong. And uh, today I'm very glad to talk about some of recent work on the feedback effect of base roughness in particle size segregation. And so uh, we know that the sorting by particle size is a uh, really to very rich behavior in geophysical flows. For example, this, uh, this is the boundary front, body front here and the lateral levy that format in uh, typical debris flow. And then this is the fingering instability that we observe in debris avalanche. And both of these uh, phenomena has been reproduced in small scale lab tests. And uh, uh, researchers always say that those behaviors has a very complicated inter interplay with uh, boundary roughness. Like for this one, uh, only if you use, uh, uh, you place a layer of coarse sand here, that you can reproduce the behavior. So uh, this interplay between the two is what uh, I'm interested in. And then, uh, so uh, before I explain to you what the feedback effect of base roughness is, I want to define or I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what contributes to roughness. Uh, if you have a debris flow uh, where segregation is going on here, and then imagine that you have a particle running on one line of fixed particles that form a base. Uh, it's flowing to the right-hand side. And then if the particle is smaller, you would see uh, the space is rougher, relatively, while if the particle is bigger, it's smoother. 
So uh, if the particles that we arrange at the base have some spacing, then uh, of course this base becomes rougher and rougher. So we will see the roughness actually has two levels. One is the geometric roughness, which is a function of the size ratio and spacing. Well, the other one is the one we usually use, the mechanical roughness, mu uh, b at the base. So let's see what is going on here in the debris flow. Uh, if segregation is now happened, we have uh, relatively larger particles in contact with the base. Then the particles can move faster. Uh, sliding over the base, and then as segregation occurs, some small particles percolate toward the base, and then we get more particles coming down, and you can see the velocity of the particles near the base became uh, nearly zero. And so compared to this one, you have a rather a larger base velocity. So you could see the interplay between segregation and base roughness, and the change of base roughness. And uh, actually, this is the purpose of this study is to understand the relative significance of geometry roughness and mechanical roughness at the base. Uh, this is something we have published last year on physical review e to uh, generalize the, uh, the roughness, uh, the geometric roughness. So uh, we, we call this uh, generalized roughness uh, RA because it's a roughness defined by IRA ratio. So uh, here is just a very basic idea of this definition. So if you have a base, formed by spheres, uh, just uh, arbitrary packing of spheres, and you can uh, discretize it into triangulars into using this triangulation scheme. And then we look at each local triangle. So the, each triangle, you will uh, be able to work out its area based on the sp spacing that you can measure. And then this area will compare to the other area we call it the area at the most stable station uh, situation, where the, the particle wh which is flowing coplanar with the other three particles form the triangle. So this is the most stable case because the particle is basically trapped here, it cannot move. So this ratio gives us a number at each single triangle, and we get the statistics of this RA. And you can see this RA is basically a function of spacing and size ratio, as we said before. So more details, you can check this paper. So what we are going to, how we are going to study the basal effect here is we generate this bidispersed uh, granular flow over a slope by using this uh, periodic boundary setup. Uh, that means the, this, this represents a, a very long and very wide flow uh, flowing down slope. Uh, large particles are initially at the base, and it will segregate later. So uh, we have different ways to uh, generate the base. So here you have uh, one single layer of random packed particles at the base, or you can have some thicker layers so that you have some bumps on the surface. Uh, and then you can have uh, regular packing or uh, regular, packing with, uh, re regular packing with spacing. So these numbers are the RA that we calculated for different cases, like uh, this, uh, for small and large particles representatively. So this one, uh, for small particle, it's rougher than large particle, always. And this base with bumps will give us a higher uh, number of roughness. Well, this one layer thing is sm smaller. And if it's order packing, it's even smaller. But if you have some spacing, this is theoretical optimal uh, packing, uh, so that you can have this theoretically uh, the most rough case. So roughness equal to one. And what we have done before is uh, we have tested our definition of roughness in a model dispersed flow where no segregation goes on. And uh, we have uh, constructed many different bases, not just the four here, uh, different bases. But no matter how you construct the base, and no matter what the size ratio you're using between the base particle and the flowing particle, it's only this generalized, generalized uh, uh, geometry roughness matter, matter that uh, it, if it increases from zero to one, zero means a flight plane. And one means this optimum packing. And you can have a transition from sleeve to non-sleeve uh, flow regimes. OK, so here is the uh, first example I gave you about our current study. Uh, this is the, when it's inclined to this uh, slope angle, the segregation will go on. And you can see that uh, uh, this is the evolution of the base roughness because you have large and small particles. So it will initially it's, it's smaller because large particles are here, and then uh, as uh, this is a degree of segregation, 
As aggregation goes on, small particles populate to the base, so you, uh, the roughness is relatively larger. So when the roughness is relatively larger, the base velocity that we measure at the bottom would be very close to zero. So, but the, at the beginning, it, there is a very small slip here, so you have an increase, you have a peak, small peak of kinetic energy. And this is the second case where the roughness is smoother. So in this case, you could see everything is low, mm -hmm. and, but there is a very uh, sharp peak at the beginning, which corresponds to a uh, basal sliding here. The basal sliding corresponds to this, uh, the, the duration where large particle in contact <coughs> with the base. And if you look closer to the initial stage, you could see the large particles, they are ordered uh, packing. So that means it's crystallized just this very short period of time, uh, where the segregation actually is also slightly delayed. So uh, here I'm going to show you the effect of base roughness in the most systematic way. So if we uh, increase the geometry roughness from a flat plane to a rougher base, you could see the uh, geometry roughness is increasing, and the degree of segregation gets higher and higher, but the process of segregation became faster and faster. And also, uh, you could uh, monitor the sleep and non sleep condition at the base, which is corresponding to the geometric mm -hmm. roughness we have. Okay, so, uh, and then uh, we can look at the velocity profile. The velocity profile, they are basically parallel. The only difference is that we have a basal shear layer. And then this is the effect of mechanical uh, of friction, and act only if there's a very small value that it matters. But if it's large, then uh, very similar results. And if it's small, you may see plug flow and slip at the base and crystallization and hinder segregation. Well, if the geometry roughness is enough, it doesn't matter at all. So uh, as here is just uh, some uh, reference for you to see uh, when this crystallization will occur. And what we have found that is actually mainly determined by geometry roughness. So uh, what we're going to do next is to study this in a transient system, a dam break case, where uh, we have done some pre preliminary uh, uh, experiments, some trial cases, but this is quite uh, preliminary, so I'm not going to show you the details. And then this is our future work, is one is to get a scaling, and then, yeah. I so, <laughs> yeah, just last sentence, uh, yeah, just do something to refer, refer to what uh, Antonio Thornton has talked right. about. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So we have time for a very quick question. Uh, so I, I have a very quick question, maybe yeah. that will bleed into the discussion later, and that is, um, uh, so Anthony sort of focused a little bit on, with his model on the mechanism for segregation, and it seems like you have sort of a, a boundary condition associated with segregation. Have you tried to link the boundary condition and its effect on segregation to the dynamics and the mechanisms of segregation. Do you understand what I'm saying? So he yeah, was looking, yeah. okay. I think that that's uh, what the uh, mobility feedback effect we call it. And I think that's the next stage. Okay, great, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank our you. speaker again. Next speaker is uh, Matteo Saletti from University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. We'll be talking about step pool, mountain streams, stability. So thank you very much. Uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next minutes is the formation of a step pool morphology. And despite this picture of the beautiful jamming steps uh, that we got in the lab, I'm going to use mostly numerical results compared with the field observation. So the main question I want to try to answer here is which processes are fundamental for the formation of step? And to answer this question, we adopt a reduced complexity approach. That means that instead of trying to put every single process in the model, we try to reduce the complexity of the system by eliminating the processes that we think are not essential to observe uh, the phenomenon. So we develop uh, a new reduced complexity model with two grain sizes. And this model simulates uh, the steep channel evolution at the uh, patch scale. And the model is particle based. This means that we follow the fate of every single particle in the system. And uh, we model stochastically the processes of entrainment and the position you see here a sketch of the model, particle transport, and some basic granular interactions. 
So our recipe for step formation uh, and stability uh, has four main ingredients. The first one being flood events. And by flood events, I mean events that are able to mobilize the coarse fraction. So this big boulder that I sketched here in red. And so to rearrange the morphology and the coarse fraction actually act as a keystone for the formation of step. The second re uh, ingredient being particle jamming as the granular process uh, which leads to particle blocking and deposition and uh, as a consequence to their enhanced uh, resistance to displacement. If you want, this is the main idea of the jam state hypothesis. The third ingredient is the low sediment supply because we want to avoid step burial. And the fourth one being having grains of different uh, sizes, which means different entrainment probabilities in our model. You see here the two different patches in a, a steep stream. Uh, so the model, uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to present some basic assumptions. So we discretize the space uh, in a way in which every grid cell can be occupied by either a patch of coarse or a fine sediment. And the distinction between a coarse and fine is made on the grounds of their entrainment probability. If you see here on the x-axis, you have the relative exposure, or if you want, the protrusion of a particle on the bed. And here in the y-axis, you have the entrainment probability. And at base flow, uh, a coarse patch, you see here in red, has a much, for the same value of relative exposure, has a much lower entrainment probability than a fine patch. That's the way we model the difference. Uh, during flood events, instead, we, you have here a sketch of the flood, so you have an instantaneous peak followed by a recession part. At flood peak, these two functions collapse. That means that uh, at flood peak, the flood uh, doesn't care about size, so it's equally able to entrain coarse and fine particles. And then, uh, during the recession part, it goes back to having two different uh, distributions. Uh, particle jamming is modeled as a consequence of transport saturation. So when the transport layer in one cross section is filled with particles, they all get jammed and deposited all in once, and they have an enhanced resistance to displacement. So these are the main ingredients. So if we include all these processes in our model, we are able to produce a bad morphology which has steps and pulls. You see here a digital elevation model taken from one of the output of the numerical simulation, and you see these uh, local jumps in elevations, which are steps, followed by area of negative uh, slopes, which are pools. And if you compare two longitudinal profiles, the upper one being taken from a, a, a field observation, so this is a real step pool channel, and this one is the output of one of the numerical simulation, you can see that they share this common morphological feature, steps and pools, steps and pools. So to answer the main question, are these processes really fundamental, are really necessary to generate steps? Uh, to answer this question, we need a meaningful metric and we need comparison with field data. So we identify this metric in step density, which is the number of cross-sections having steps divided by the total number of cross-sections. And as you can see in this graph, this is where nature stands. So we have some field observation taken in four different step pool streams, and these are the value of step density that we observe in nature. Then what we did, what we did was a numerical exercise. So we ran additional simulation taking out singularly one of these four processes. And this is what we observe. I plotted here the results in terms of frequency because in numerical simulation we have the advantage, the advantage that we can measure step density at every single time step. So I'm plotting um, the entire simulation results in terms of the, uh, their frequency. So if we remove floods, this is what we get. So with no floods, we have basically no step. You see step density is very, very low, it's almost zero. So without flood event, we cannot get any step. What if we don't account for jamming? Uh, well, this is more or less the same. You see very, very low value of step density and no, absolutely no uh, direct comparison with field data. What if we have a high sediment supply? Well, we can generate some steps, but most of them are then buried by, by subsequent uh, sediment. So you see step density is a bit higher, but it's still very far from the value that we measure in nature. What if we remove the two different grain size? So we say, okay, the, the entrainment probability is the same for every single grain. That's the assumption of having a uniform grain size. You see, step density is still very low, a bit higher than before, so we can generate some steps, but the values are pretty different. 
And the moment we consider uh, the four processes, we start moving our distribution on the right side. So I want to make two points here. The first one, you can clearly see the difference between the distribution by only eliminating one of these processes singularly and the distribution by considering all these processes. So they are pretty different. And second, uh, the field data plot here, of course, uh, the model is not perfect because it's a really simplified model, but since we are plotting all the values of step density that we can possibly get, you see that some of them fall within the distribution of our data. So given the, this result, we propose a conceptual model for the formation and stability of steps. So the first element is a large flood event. And by large, I don't mean any specific value, but an event which is able to mobilize this coarse fraction and so to rearrange the morphology. Then we need uh, a step forming mechanism and we identify this mechanism in particle jamming. I don't want to exclude all the other mechanisms that are there in the literature. They, they are important probably as well, but we show that the jamming of particle can be effective in generating step. And then for the stability of these steps, you need a low sediment supply to avoid these steps to be buried by sediment. And you need what I call the grain size dependent entrainment. So to avoid the fact that this particle can be remobilized during a low flow, you need to have different sizes and therefore different entrainment probabilities. So in conclusion, uh, we show that with a numerical simulation with our reduced complexity model, we are able to reproduce a stepful morphology which share common feature with uh, measurement done in the field in terms of step density. We propose then a conceptual model for the formation of step in which the key to generate and maintain steps are these four processes. So the presence of flood events, the particle jamming, having a low sediment supply, and different grain sizes with different entrainment probability. Then how do we move from here? I, I make the point here that we need additional flume experiment and field survey to test this hypothesis. Um, mainly because if jamming is, is really one of the leading mechanisms leading to step formation, you would expect with variation, which enhance the jamming of particles, to play a major role in the formation of steps. And this is what we are currently testing in a flume at the University of British Columbia, and I hope I will be able to present this result to the next AGU. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Plenty of time for questions. Morgan? Yeah, correct. So it's for those of you at the back, the question is, what is your definition of jamming? Well, more precisely, I wonder if you should include in that the definition in particle velocity to be more. Yeah. And should it include yeah. particle velocity? Yeah, so uh, that's correct. So particle jamming is defined in terms of saturation. So when, when in the transport layer you have uh, all particles, so in, uh, in, one, in one single cross-section, they are saturated and, and they get blocked like in a, in a geometric process. And second, in terms of velocity, this is one of the simplification of the model, they have a constant velocity. So they all move with the same, uh, with the same velocity. Okay, another question at the back? Yes, you, kind of have it. Okay, I'm, I'm, yeah, so maybe can you ask your question during the break because we're out of time, I'm sorry, yeah. Thanks, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> sorry, I said break, but I meant discussion period. So at the end there'll be a discussion period where you can ask all the speaker questions. Uh, next speaker is uh, Dylan Lee. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll be talking about bursty transport events. Quite curious to hear about this. <coughs> so this is the mouse. I don't know how to start your presentation, so can you do that? Okay. Here's the mouse. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Full screen mode. Go down. Go down. Go down. There we go. Okay. So today I'm going to be talking to you about bed load transport, specifically. Um, how the nature of bellow transport changes in a model system as we vary the mean transport rate 
from low to high. So according to Gary Parker's threshold channel hypothesis, gravel bed rivers organize themselves such that they're at threshold on the banks and they're only marginally above threshold at the channel bed. This has been seen in many natural rivers. So for example, in this stream in Puerto Rico, as we go downstream, we see that the ratio of dimensionless shear stress to dimensionless cr shear critical shear stress stays approximately constant. So this implies that in nature, almost all bed transport is near threshold. A defining characteristic of near threshold transport is that it's highly intermittent. This can be seen in this time series of a measure of particle activity. As you can see, we get kind of unevenly spaced periods of activity followed by um, kind of unpredictable periods of quiescence. So what gives rise to this intermittency? Um, there are a number of proposed factors. One of them is this, these kind of turbulent fluctuations in the fluid driving stress near the boundary. Another fact is that the boundary right is composed of this disordered granular bed and that provides a variable resistive force to this turbulent driving. A third factor that's been proposed is that when grains are entrained, they're often entrained collectively or in bunches. So in this cartoon here, we see that mobile grains have been color coded as a function of time, and at time steps two through four, we see that this cluster of grains begins to move collectively off the bed. So in this talk, we'll mostly be focusing on how collective motion might be influencing the intermittency of transport. So one way to look at how collective motion could be introducing variance is to look at how collective motion is affecting this E-turn, this entrainment rate function, in one probabilistic definition of bed load flux. Um, and so to look at how collective motion affects the entrainment rate function, our effects entrainment, what we'll be doing is using a directly observable measure of collective motion in an experimental system. So the experiments were set up as such, uh, flume approximately two meters long by two centimeters in width. So this very narrow flume allows us to create a quasi two dimensional bed that we can then use to explicitly see both bed structure and grain activity on the surface. In the experiment, slope and water discharge was kept constant, and the thing that we varied was the frequency that we introduced grains upstream. Um, and so we provide, perform five different experiments with five different feed frequencies, ranging about an order of magnitude. Um, we situated a camera about two-thirds of the way down the flume. This gives us a viewing window where we can track the centroids of all the particles, and we can then link those centroids into a trajectory. This is an traje example trajectory of one saltating grain as it moves through the viewing window. Can you comment on grain size distribution just quickly? It's bimodal. Um, one 16 millimeter, one 12 millimeter, and they're marbles. Okay, um, so once we have those trajectories, we can then look at particles immigrating over a line. So we obtain these, so the line is basically at this fixed position in the viewing window. And we can then um, obtain these time series of immigration events, particles moving over this line. And what, we, what that allows us to do is we can then look at these times that we have to wait in between immigration events. And when we do that, we can get these what are called waiting time distributions. And then that, these distributions give some idea of the intermittency or variance of the transport um, for the five different feed rates used. Okay, so these are the waiting time distributions. As you can see, um, so like the, the different feed frequencies are color coded and expressed in terms of marbles per minute because here the marbles are the grains. And so what you can see is that all the distributions actually display a similar shape. Um, they deviate significantly from this dotted black line, which is a Poissonian distribution, which is what we would expect if the waiting times were time independent and non-correlated. One interesting th thing to note is that if we non-dimensionalize the waiting times by the feed frequency or the rate that we're feeding grains into the bed, much of the spread of the distribution um, goes away. So this, this points to the fact that the rate that we are feeding grains into the system does actually have a strong control on the, wa the waiting times between active events. Um, however, it's not the only control, and this can be seen if we look at the average waiting time as a function of feed frequency. And so at high, so this dash black, I mean this dash red line 
is what you would expect if the average waiting time were simply a function of the inverse of the feed frequency. And what you see is that high feed frequency, this expectation actually appears to be met. And, but as we lower the feed frequency, the average waiting time appears to grow faster than this naive expectation. So what this appears to say is that as we're approaching this near, near threshold transport state, um, the time you have to wait in between events goes up faster than the, than, you know, the time scale associated with introducing grains into the bed. Um, and so, you know, uh, so basically this can be seen qualitatively in the experiment as an increase in the perceived burstiness of transport. And so we've looked at how waiting times affect the intermittency and so how does collective motion um, play a role? And so to look at that, what we did was we looked at mobile clusters of grains moving within a fixed distance of each other at different times. So in this cartoon, you can see between time steps two through four, this would be a cluster of five grains rolling or moving along the bed together. Um, we define mobility using a threshold velocity that was determined by examining the velocity distributions of all grains in the viewing window for a given experiment. And so when we look at the distribution of collective motion events, what we see is that they actually don't appear to change very much between the driving frequencies that we used. And so they appear approximately exponential and they all appear to follow a similar slope. Um, okay, and so what does this mean? Well, uh, using our current definition of collective motion, it appears that the length scale of collective events does not really change between a very slowly driven experiment and a very quickly driven experiment. What does change, though, is that the growth in intermittent transport um, appears to be coming from this divergence in the waiting time statistics as you lower the feed rate. So this kind of um, indicates that collective motion is actually happening in the system all the time, but as transport becomes more continuous, these events kind of merge together, and um, transport becomes less intermittent. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Okay, we have lots of time for questions. So I had, oh, sorry, go, yeah. Uh, well, uh, if you, you would have guessed, then what would be the major driving uh, factor for the fact that we should uh, uh, Oh, impacts. And, in, and we actually have data that shows that if you, Basically, if you sum the total kinetic energy deposited into the bed in the viewing window during an active event, you c it's, it's basically linear related to the total displacement of all the grains that occur during that, that transport event. It, it's pretty nice, a pretty nice relationship. I just didn't have time to show it. But it's, it's probably impacts because these grains are very large. And so they have high Stokes numbers even in water. Um, well, I, the collective motion actually we think is arising from the dynamics of the impacts of the uh, saltating grains kind of smashing into the bed. We do actually so have velocity... Have pro you, you see particles saltating? Yes. But we do have velocity profiles actually obtained by Raleigh Martin in, in this setup. Velocity yeah. profiles of the particle or of the fluid? The fluid. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, no, I have a question. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the, um, so do, have you looked at all about how the segregation or the size-dependent transport might change as you get closer to the threshold motion? Because you do have a bimodal mixture, and I didn't hear any mention of that. Yeah, we have not examined the segregation. It would be possible with image processing because I have been able to pretty reliably, you know, we say, oh, that's a small one, that's a big one, you know. Um, they... Qualitatively, they do form these like vertically segregated chains, mm. which is really interesting. Hmm. Um, so, be interesting to look at. It would be, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Well, you, you should say that you chose the grains, you chose the grains so that they weren't so different that they were strongly segregated, right? So it's so that they don't crystallize. They're slightly different, so they don't crystallize, Wait. but they're not so different that they're strong. Well, what was I thought it was a factor of two or one and a half? What was the difference? No, <coughs> 
What was the different? What was the particle uh, sizes? You uh, mentioned twelve about? millimeters and sixteen millimeters, so a factor of like one. Point. Okay. I think there is uh, some fuel for the for the discussion at the end, uh, <laughs> and for the time being, uh, we the next. Uh, we thank the speaker again. Oh. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> really sorry. So many I'm sorry. Can I can I suggest that that F oh sorry yeah. onto them and and uh, we'll be able to cover them then. Next speaker is. Yeah. Next speaker we have Gary Parker. We're talking about downstream finding and the famous gravel sand transition. Could, um, right after Gary finishes, could we please have the poster presenters come up to the front so you're ready to sort of move through very quickly your pop-ups? So, so you can either advance it from there or you can use the keyboard. Can you use the keyboard or the it's mouse? Down. You can probably use down here. There. Okay. okay. Um, uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, Judy Hashenberger, by the luck of the draw, gave an excellent introduction to many of the topics I'm going to be discussing. Uh, I'll just remark from the beginning um, that these days, if you hear this, that, or the other, you'll hear that something is a social construct, something else is a social construct. Recently, gender is supposed to be a social construct. And in the context of my talk, the idea of class-supported or matrix-supported is a social construct, because we're going to be considering uniform Grain size, um, unimodal grain size distributions from all the way to coarse gravel to fine sand, and there's no obvious divider between them. So the topic is um, downstream finding in rivers with unimodal sand gravel feed. And uh, this is material that I've been working, um, I started working on when I spent three months uh, with Mike Lamb and discussing back and forth with him at Caltech. And I show an exa a very famous example that's not unimodal. It's the Kinu River in Japan, upstream gravel, downstream sand. Um, there's Mike, hi. Um, and rivers often show long profile upward concavity and downstream finding, such as in the famous case of the Kinu River. And the characteristic rain size may not find monotonically. There may be a gravel sand transition. In the case of the Kinu River, it's quite extreme. So the Kinu River is a very typical example. Yatsu did the first major research on such transitions. Well, if your grain size distribution is bimodal, if your feed sediment is bimodal, you're going to force a transition, a sudden transition from the coarse mode to the fine mode somewhere. It's not internal to the dynamics of sediment transport. We're looking for something that's internal to the dynamics. And uh, this paper greatly intrigued me. Um, in which uh, it was argued that a gravel sand tra transition occurred not for the reasons that people have cited previously, which are external, but due to the internal dynamics of sediment transport itself, under which when the slope became low enough, uh, the sand would be forced out of suspension and would then bury the gravel, hmm. uh, due to internal dynamics again. So that's the basic idea. And if this is real, it corresponds to an autogenic gravel sand transition not imposed by bimodality, not imposed by breaking down of crystalline structure or other things. It sounded like a lot of fun to investigate. I'm not sure that we really have a whole lot of answers right now, but it's fun. So to study this case, we need a unimodal sediment feed and see if we can let the morphodynamics do the segregation. And here's again the grain size distribution that we use for the simulations that I'm going to show today. Uh, it's 80% sand and 20% gravel, but from 0 0.065 millimeters to 256 millimeters. There it is. Oh, it says 50%, but it's 80%. Oh, oh that example is 50%. We're going to do 80% later. Sorry. So what do I do about the sediment transport and morphodynamics in a world where relations have been developed separately for gravel bed and sand bed rivers? Well, for bed load transport, we can reliably use the ashida michue equation for bed load transport of mixtures um, because uh, the database uh, includes both sand and gravel. And uh, as much as I like the Wilcock and Crow work, we can't use that because two millimeters is built in as a fixed point to it. And we want things to arise autogenically here. Now, suspended sediment load is a huge problem. I won't go through the details, but this is a relationship for near bed concentration. This is Wright Parker for mixtures. And it is a descendant 
of Garcia Parker for uniform material in which that entrainment rate is a function of the shear velocity over fall velocity times a particle Reynolds number to a power. Okay? Sorry. Oh, this, this will do, this will do. Uh, and this was all derived for sand less than 0.6 uh, millimeters because, well, like mine, that's where the story is if you're looking at suspension. However, in principle, a mega flood of the type that Mike Lamb likes to talk about these days can put gravel in suspension. And any physical relation we build ought not to care. You need not to, we shouldn't be specifying it's sand or gravel. The inter it should be built in. So the original Garcia Parker relation copiously and spuriously suspends gravel. Four millimeters suspends as easily as 0.25 millimeters, almost as easily. The reason is, as grain size increases, the particle Reynolds number increases, causing this parameter ZU to increase, pushing up the near bit concentration. What can we do? Well, here is a relationship between a dimensionless fall velocity versus particle Reynolds number. And this is based on the Dietrich curve. This is the Dietrich curve, I'm sorry, not based on it. And these are the points covered by the original Garcia Parker database. And if we look at that database, we can get a database, we can get a simple regression relationship um, between dimensionless particle uh, fall velocity and Reynolds number. Now, if we recast the entrainment rate in terms of dimensionless fall velocity based on a, a regression fit in this range alone, we solve the problem because as RF, as, as REP gets larger and larger and larger, RF does not. It naturally tops out around 1.5 millimeters. So now we see the four millimeter material before the correction, after the correction, its suspendability has gone down by three orders of magnitude. Okay, the generalization to Wright Parker for sediment mixtures, including a hiding type function, slope, et cetera, is straightforward, but God damn it, something else happens. It contains a normalization based on the surface geometric mean size of the bed. And if 70% of that bed is gravel, the surface geometric mean size will be so large that for the suspendable sizes, di over dg will be so small that you won't suspend a goddamn thing. What to do? Well, simple idea, partially based on Grams and Wilcock. We're looking at the bed from the top. We have exposed non-suspendable material. We have exposed suspendable material. Normalize that geometric mean size to the geometric mean of the fraction of bed surface covered by sizes that can actually be suspended. No dimensions put in. It's all dimensionless in doing the calculations, but that's what we can do. Now, one more thing. Um, uh, uh, Lam and Venditti associated um, uh, part of the autogenic change to a structure according to which a threshold condition for suspension increases above the Van Ryan value of 0.4 for particles less than about 0.36 millimeters. We're going to vary that threshold. So the idea is if you get fine enough, it's harder to suspend, you keep it in bed load. We're going to look at ranges for that Nino Garcia threshold of 0.5 millimeters and 1 millimeter too. 1 millimeter is extreme, but I'll explain. Okay, final thing. As the sediment deposits, what material grain size division should be transferred between the active layer and the substrate in a numerical model? Active layer grain size division only? Is that the best representative reality? Mix of active layer and bed load grain size distributions? Or mix of active layer and bed load and suspended load grain size distributions? There's simply no data available to figure out what to do when suspension is important. But One minute. For the sake of generality, we use that, okay? Equations, they exist. <laughs> we have a river with a wide floodplain flowing through an area of subsidence, such as a foreland basin. Subsidence dries um, uh, upward concavity. No tributaries, no abrasion. Simplify those things out. Unimodal, 80% sand. Uh, no Garcia limit on, on suspension, long profiles, upward concave, slope declining downstream, and 
If you look here, half the reach is in the gravel size, half is in the sand size, and there's no autogenic jumps anywhere. It's mm -hmm. continuous. We put in the Nino Garcia limit on suspension below 36.36 millimeters. Again, continuous downstream finding with no jumps. But if we force the problem and use one millimeter, uh, put concave profiles, slope has some funny features, and lo and behold, I don't know how real it is, we've got two autogenic gravel sand transitions, 31 millimeter and 1 to 0.6 mm. millimeter, since we're out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, we have time for one or two quick questions. And again, while we are going through that question period, can the, po the pop-up presenters please come to the front? Okay, the argument is that once we get fine enough, viscous effects start to be important. And those viscous effects affect the turbulence and affect the ability to su 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 suspend the finer material. That's the argument. You want to go ahead? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, it's kind of forcing a bimodality, isn't it? What is? You choose one millimeter. No, one millimeter was never chosen anywhere. What's that? One millimeter was never chosen anywhere. Okay, it's not, okay, I, then the, you're right, I should explain. I used one millimeter for the sake of argument. The relationship is actually expressed in terms of dimensionless parameters. So it involves a dimensionless particle Reynolds number. So in, in that sense, since it's a dimensionless parameter, it's only, impo it, it's not imposing a specific dimension. In other words, if you change gravity, you change the uh, density of the water, et cetera, it would change. Okay, let's, let's thank Gary again, and there'll be time during the discussion. <laughs> He's escaping, don't let him go. <laughs> I think we begin, we have four, four, four pop-ups. Four posters, po four pop-ups of a minute each. Yeah. Anna Pelosi. Um, Okay. Uh, the poster is uh, about uh, modeling, um, uh, advection and dispersion of pebble tracers uh, in river. Uh, and um, actually we introduce a, a new uh, age-based formulation um, by considering uh, uh, the tracers dynamic as a population dynamic model. And uh, in, this, in this case, this allows to, uh, to, in, to, to employ um, uh, particle waiting time probability density function into the Excel-based formulation, uh, which we proposed in 2014. Uh, and uh, um, the in, actually, the thickness of the waiting time uh, probability density function um, uh, is important because uh, uh, explain uh, the different uh, um, diffusion pattern that uh, uh, may arise, uh, like normal, sub, and super diffusion. We, we show uh, preliminary examples uh, with the active layer uh, assumption. And then when vertical mixing is considering, also we, we have more results about that. So thank you. Please come to the poster. <laughs> So quick reminder, we do have a poster session the first half of this afternoon, and also there are the, our poster presenters will be here for the discussion as well if you have questions. Oh, next, uh, Sanam Borani, please. Uh, I am Sanas Borhani, and I am working on statistically based morphodynamic modeling of tracer dispersal. Um, so, tracer zones uh, are used to study the bed load transport in the field and in the laboratory scale because they are easy to track. Uh, however, it's not easy to model tracer dispersal using uh, available 
uh, layer-based uh, approaches because they are not um, able to capture the fact that tracer particles can be buried deep in the deposit or on the bars. So in our model, <coughs> we use a continuous model, which is um, introduced by Parker, Paula, and Leclerc, uh, and it is based on probability function of bell elevation fluctuations. And we validate our results with uh, one experiments that you saw a picture of their experiments in previous slide. And our colleagues at University of Minnesota, Professor Hill and her student Amir, are working um, in a different approach on, on this problem to determine the probability distribution functions. And I'm asking Amir to present his work. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker that will be Amireza Gazemi. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Sana. As Sana said, we use discrete element or discrete particle method <coughs> to simulate the sediment transport for now just monosized gravel particles. And here are the picture for two bit different conditions and I have a few questions for you and while you are thinking <coughs> about that I want to play a movie so the, oh. what's like <laughs> oh yeah it's not very good like okay so there, there are a little bit Motion. different in the bed uh, situation the bed conditions so if you can see one of them is more rougher and the only difference is for the bed shear stresses. So, yes, and what is like, what do you think, which one is, has the higher shear stresses? So, I think you all may know the answer, but if you don't know, you can figure it out by stopping at my poster. I'm just kidding. So, uh, <laughs> here is like the answer. And so, the one on the right has a higher shear stress, and we found as we increase the shear stress, we have a more variability in the bed elevation and for more details you can stop at my poster and I would be glad to for your comments and any recommendations for future work so see you in the poster hall. <laughs> and finally Irana Denison Irana Denison Hi, I'm Irana Denison and I'm working on bulbous head formation in biodispersed uh, <laughs> particles flows together with my uh, supervisors Anthony, Thomas and Stefan. And what happens here is that uh, if you have biodispersed flow, two sides of particles, the large particles segregate upwards, flow on top of the smaller particles. Because the velocity there is higher, they are preferentially sheared to the front. So yeah, now you have a front of large particles which have more bottom friction than the mixture and then they act as some kind of break, and therefore uh, you have this bulbous head formation. We can simulate this with uh, particle simulations, which are accurate. So we compute all the forces for each particle, velocities, positions, but it's inefficient, it takes a long time. We also have a continuum model, which is efficient, because it's a 1D continuum model, but if it's accurate, <laughs> find out at my poster this afternoon. <laughs> and if you also want to play with Anthony Stories, <laughs> then come to my post. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much to all of the poster presenters, especially for being so efficient in your one minute presentation. So we're going to, uh, would you like to take over and announce the discussion? Uh, we, we invite all speakers to come forward because the idea now is to try uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes to uh, have an exchange with the audience. It's not finished yet. Uh, we have a panel discussion, and um, the time that everybody is, is coming, in fact, uh, I have just two, two ideas. I don't want to influence, no, not uh, keep standing because it's quite cold here, so just, <laughs> ju just keep, keep standing because I'm, I'm quite cold here. There is some, uh, and um, actually, uh, I don't want to influence the, what uh, the questions you would have between the audience and the speakers, but uh, me personally, I have two, uh, two things. Uh, this uh, last poster pop-up uh, uh, gave me an idea uh, about upscaling because uh, some of the talks we had was about uh, 
uh, discrete particle simulations, discrete particle uh, theory. It's very interesting, but how do we upscale uh, in continuum models to actually uh, address larger scale? And the second thing is about segregation by size, but also other properties like uh, density, shape, and so on. I would argue maybe in nature everything is about segregation. But perhaps it's not true. Uh, everything is about segregation in, uh, to, to create morphodynamic patterns. But maybe some of the patterns don't need segregation or, or grain size sorting. So this is just two ideas. But please uh, proceed. Uh, any questions about, uh, about any topics uh, we had uh, today, uh, feel free to, uh, to, to discuss uh, uh, among us. There's a question? No. Okay, so, um, oh yeah. So, so we don't exactly know. Um, we speculate that the finest particles are inhibited in their trajectories because uh, there's vertical drag on their upward um, uh, mo movement that makes their trajectories smaller. Um, I think it's something we need to explore further. Uh, we didn't examine the mineralogy of the particles, but I think it's very dominantly quartz. But we certainly didn't examine from a size selective framework, so I don't know. Um, if it were denser, I would imagine that it would um, have more inertia in transport and therefore overcome some of that vertical drag effect. Um, but I, I don't really know, to be honest. Um, the very fine particles are more difficult to entrain by the fluid directly because there are cohesive effects that keep them bound together. However, that seems to be overcome by the splash, which penetrates into multiple particle diameters into the bed, which kind of uh, disturbs all of the, the surface um, distribution of particle sizes and gets them moving. So I don't think hiding is necessarily a factor in aeolian dynamics. Maybe to keep along the lines of uh, the alien dynamics somewhat, I'm wondering, Natalie, you talked about some dune dynamics, and I'm just wondering what role of alien dynamics do you think, um, what, what, what role do they play in, in the problems that you're looking at right now? You mean, you mean the, the specific particle uh, saltation processes? Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, well, the, so the, the, um, I think we, we have done some, some aqueous uh, um, experiments as well on dune migration. And we do see some layering in there. So I don't think saltation is the only like, mechanism to create r layers and structures in dunes. Um, obviously, you do need sand transport. And you need accumulation of grains at the, at the crest of a dune. And then you get avalanches coming down. So there is there's some correlation, but it's not... The, the only process of creating structure and layers. So maybe I'll just uh, re repeat a little bit of Philippe's question a little bit. And you know, there's a number of you are here wondering about granular physics and, and scaling up issues. And so I guess I'm going to turn it on the audience as well as on our speakers. I, um, for a, a, what, what would you say is the next problem that you would like to see addressed, or alternatively, I mean, and it could be in your research, 
or it could be for your general field that you're not touching on. What sort of, what questions did this bring up for you? Yeah, I feel obliged because I didn't show any, but I have some idea for, uh, because I'm doing vertical fluid flow, and actually I've heard from other people that there is, there is in sediment record of, of you know, um, vertical injection in, in seabed, for example, where you see a segregation, vert like in the horizontal plan, you'll see segregation of, of this differential erosion because, so if you imagine this experiment when channelizing, if you have different particle, the fine might get untrained and the big fill it up. And so what I got is that you can get the, a coarser channel and, but this dynamic is all, even with one size, it's, it's, there's a lot still to do about this channelization dynamic. So I, I, I'll be interested in to look at this at a point. I think w one very interesting thing that came through in different talks, some people have a more particle approach and other people, like Anthony, for example, started with continuum modeling. And I think scale is a very kind of critical aspect. So how do you capture particle properties and how does that actually translate to large scale rivers, dunes, avalanches? And I'm, I'm, I think the, the, the next big question is to figure out, are we able to connect it to and actually get all the information from one scale to another? Or is there something that we will always be missing if we um, not look at one, one component of that? Any comments? <laughs> I have some ideas, but I don't want to, to speak too much. Uh, I think that uh, when you do some uh, particle modeling or so on, uh, or um, some experiments and some numerical uh, experiments, uh, maybe you, you, you are able to, let's say, pa parameterize uh, some, uh, yeah, some, some laws, some, some theory, and then feed this into uh, continuum models. It, can, it could, could be uh, multiphasic models, but up to uh, shallow water models, which, are, which we use, of course, for research and uh, and engineering um, as well. This is the, the, the way in a, a kind of a upscaling cascade. Maybe, okay, it's very idealized. I don't know uh, what the audience or the speakers have to say about this. I just want to make one comment, and maybe a plug for some of the posters this afternoon, is that a lot of the modeling of size selective transport is done uh, assuming steady uniform flow conditions. But in fact, in both fluvial and aeolian and hill slope environments, there's a lot of heterogeneity in sizes, and all these processes occur non-locally, so there's a dependence on what's occurring upstream or upwind. So I think we need to be careful to account for that if we're trying to apply these kind of size-selective transport models to uh, morphodynamic evolution. To answer Natalie, uh, or, or I think I have a point about this, which, which is new and probably interesting, is that uh, as we observe in the, this experiment I posited before in UPenn, that it seems that there is also vertical segregation in the creep regime when you have an avalanche or, or, or sediment transport, and that is a totally different scale because it's very slow. And so that's, uh, uh, and we still don't really know actually how that's going. I mean, we can, we can parameterize and explain, but it's, a, it's, it's an interface where both this thing's happening differently at a very different rates, but it seems to be happening. So that's, that's an open question also for this integration over time and space. So along those lines, I'm going to do a... Oh, 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 okay, Mike. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to come up here? I can repeat it if it's... Uh, okay, great, thank you. Sorry, the cord is woefully short. It's not really designed... <laughs> going to answer, try and answer a qu your question about what, where should we be going, what should we be doing next. I notice in the experimental work that we're, for understandable reasons, quite addicted to marbles and other sorts of little spheres. And what I would like to suggest is that to understand what happens in relation to natural materials, we need to parallel the experiments we do with these spheres with similarly characterized natural materials. My guess is that particle shape effects, although they seem to be second order from the work that we've done, nevertheless interfere with percolation possibilities of different sizes and consequently they may make some significant changes in the sorts of segregation phenomena that we see and maybe ultimately in the uh, macro phenomena, I don't know. But I do think we should think more about the natural materials in parallel with the experimental materials we use.
consideration apart from the shape effect, it doesn't affect the segregation that much, but it does affect the feedback massively. The actual shape of the quantum particles really does affect the feedback in the ball point. So the, sh the particle shape is crucial if you want to understand the feedback, but the segregation is secondary. Effect. So the shape effects don't seem to affect the segregation very strongly, but they do affect the feedback, the actual change, or the effect the segregation has in the ball point. So yeah, in that case it's very important. Okay, as you can see from my talk, my, one of my focuses is on modeling of morphodynamics. And I think I mentioned that we use a so-called active layer in the morphodynamic model. We have a layer that exchanges directly with the uh, transport and a substrate below that with a uh, sharp um, interface. And that's not how reality behaves. We have, natural rivers don't know a damn thing about active layers. Uh, we, after 15 years of struggle, were able to get rid of the active layer uh, formulation and make a more dynamic relationship with no active layer for tracers in uniform material. But getting this done for mixtures is a very con more considerable challenge because of the fact that you have, you have to geometrically describe how grains fit in between each other. And uh, getting a more dynamic model, an external equation for mixtures with no active layer is not only a big challenge, but it'll enable us to solve some problems that we haven't been able to do to date. I want to make a little comment as well, partly about scaling up, but also about a challenge, and that is that um, discrete particle methods, not to be discrete, <laughs> well, uh, confused with other DEMs. <laughs> um, and so you saw that in um, Amir's talk, and you saw it in Anthony's talk a little bit. Um, it's very powerful in both in sort of capturing small scale phenomenology. And I think one of the ways that we can scale up, and, and Amir is working with Enrica's group on this and also with Sanaz as well, and trying to develop continuum rules, um, sort of similar also to what Anthony showed with his segregation, continuum rules that you can then plug into large scale phenomenology. Um, and so that is part of the, I think that is one method to scale up under certain circumstances. But then the caveat, and I think one of the challenges is in reproducing not just accurate particle-particle interactions, which you can do phenomenally well, uh, even if it's slow, phenomenally well. Um, but then what do you do with like particle and uh, fluid? Um, and especially if the fluid is like a mud, so it's kind of a particle suspension as it is. Um, so like in a debris flow or in, in a wide distributed sediment transport. Uh, so I would say that that's, that's a real challenge to doing that sort of thing. Um, and then I'm going to turn this into a question for Gary, um, because <laughs> um, you talked about uh, maybe the influence of what, I, what seemed to me as patchiness on the transition between something like a gravel to sand transition. It looked to me like it was, like partly there were, there were mobile parts and non-mobile parts, and it looked like patchiness. And I'm wondering, um, what do you think um, the usefulness is in trying to understand the particle scale processes? It's like, it's, in some ways, it's like a segregation, right? I saw there, there's sort of clumps of particles. Um, and I guess in, uh, oh, was it you, were you talking about clumps of particles moving? I'm trying to think of clumps of particles. Who was talking? Yeah, I think it was Mateo, was it? Oh, no, uh, Luis, Luis. So there's, there's clumps of particles moving, and I'm wondering, you know, that's in some sense a form of segregation, too. But um, maybe, Gary, if you could comment on small-scale particle, uh, small-scale movement in the patchiness, and then maybe Luis as well. A, a quick comment is that what we know today, based on fairly limited information, but we do know, is that if you take the same grain size distribution and allow it to form patches, the transport rate of the, of the whole can be noticeably different from when you force it not to form patches. And uh, this then feeds back into the morphoda morphodynamics itself. And there's some areas that have been explored here, but there are a lot of areas that are lacking exploration. And for me, the fun part is a sediment transport relation that works for passage patches combined with a more dynamic relationship that makes the patches and sustains them. Yeah, we have I like, think we're, are we out of time? I think so. <laughs> any, any last questions for our crew or attorney individuals? So let's, let's, 
Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're going to miss a lot of people for the show. Please do come for the first half. Yeah.